he said the learning lesson for him was to get out of the situation to be running out of money to listen to others how they did that because he was an Austrian guy he was not international he was not international very well known so how to deal with it and he had to learn how to listen to others that potentially they can help him to rescue the company and that's what he did he trust put the, all the trust on others and got the, and, and used the help from others to get the company over the fence at the end the company got sold to uh, several investors uh, one was Carla the other one was EQT and then sold to CA so it was very successful at the end Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples. Not just trending ideas or buzzword-laden schmaltz. Real-world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. How many times have you read a company's marketing and thought, they're not talking to a customer, they're talking to themselves? This is especially prevalent in B2B. I've seen this on homepages, landing pages, print ads, and press releases, and on and on. I started my career as a copywriter, and then I worked in sales enablement, so I get it. You know, It's tempting to write for the person who's signing your check, but really where the revenue for that check ultimately comes from is the customer. So always write for the customer. Or as our next guest put it in his podcast guest application, outside in messaging is the important factor for success. So true. Here to share the story behind that lesson, along with many more lesson-filled stories, is Rolf Passion, Chief Marketing Officer of X-Type. Thanks for joining us, Rolf. Hi, great to be with you. Hi, Daniel. So let's take a just super quick look at your background, long and, and storied uh, career. Let me just cherry pick a few roles here. Uh, Business Director of Enterprise Sales for Novell. Vice President of Product Marketing for CA Technologies, Global Head of Marketing for Broadcom. And as I mentioned, for the past eight months, you've been the CMO of X-Type. X-Type just recently announced $10.8 million in growth funding. And at X-Type, Ralph uh, uses, he mentioned, we're talking about team size, and he's like, hey, I'm using AI, and I'm using automation these days. Let's talk about that. He mentions he uses about five to 10 AI and automation tools every day. Uh, so, Ralph, you're you're on the bleeding edge then of of artificial intelligence use. I appreciate that. Give us a sense. What is your day like as CMO of X Type? Uh, that, that's great. I, I'm not sure if I'm on the daylight of everything, but at least I try to to be on it. So, which is a typical role of a of a, of a marketing person, right? To be to stick on what's what's the newest on. So, my 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 typical day day business is um, because I'm driven by data and data insights. So, I want to know exactly what's working, what's not working. And I'm I'm really dealing with that every day. So I want to know what fails, what what needs to be learned from the campaign, and not just sitting there for six months, which is a typical uh, marketing approach. Sitting, sitting there for six months, let's see what happened. Spent 300k for this campaign. Let's see what what the outcome was. No, we have to make fast decisions on on marketing these days, especially in the startup. Yeah, great. So you're constantly in there looking real time. How are these campaigns performing? Optimizing real time, shifting things around. Does that sound? Yes, exactly. That's exactly the gameplay. Yes. <clears throat> Perfect. All right. Well, let's take a look at uh, some lessons we can learn from the things you made in your career. I like to say that's a great thing that we as marketers can do, right? We make things. I've never been anything else like a podiatrist or a statistician or something, but I feel like we get to make things. Not everyone does. So let's take a look. Your first lesson you mentioned, outside in messaging is the important factor for success. Kind of mentioned this in the opening. How'd you learn this lesson? Um, it's 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 based on my career, to be honest with you. I was a customer before. Um, so I was a customer in a, in a data center, running a data center. So I knew exactly how many people are trying to sell something to me. And they all sold some features to me, which I'm not interested in. So same sales. So I did the movement into sales at Novell. You already mentioned that with business director. Um, and the gameplay was all about, okay, how to sell to a company in enterprise level a $6 million deal. It's not based on features. That is a value-based selling. And this value-based selling is exactly what I'm looking for outside in messaging. So when you do messaging to a customer, don't talk about your features. Don't talk about how great this green button on top right on your screen is. Nobody cares, to be honest with you. And don't try to do this as marketing because you fail as well. So for me, it's value-based selling and it's value-based messaging. And that's exactly the gameplay for, are you talking the customer story? And that's what I give my whole team and everybody who works with me a clear understanding half an outside in messaging, which means talk the language of the customer. That's the gameplay I'm looking for since almost now 25 years. Can you give us an example of how you're able to do that in one instance, or for example, of doing customer first marketing, for example, like customer first marketing is something that we talk about a lot, because a lot of times 
companies, they do that not only because they don't know the right words of the customer, but sometimes they don't, they kind of don't care enough. They're focused on their company's agenda, right? And when I wrote about this, I used an example of fiduciary duty, fiduciary responsibility. There was a big debate in the U.S. I don't know if that's, that's international, but there was a big debate in the U.S. of whether financial advisors and consultants had to have a fiduciary duty to their customers, which essentially meant legally that they put their customers' interests first. And it just blew my mind as a marketer, right? You're saying, we're a financial advisor, give us your money. And oh, by the way, we're publicly lobbying not to put your interest first, right? <laughs> so the uh, marketer blew my mind. So do you have a, an example in your career? Or have you had to work on customer first marketing to do that outside in messaging to put that customer first? Yeah. Mm, if sales, again, uh, starting with the sales approach, so getting into a, getting to a higher level, let's say if you want to go, everybody in sales wants to go to C-level because they know the money sits there. The CFO, the CIO, the Pick and choose. The see most these days because we have marketing tool stacks as well. We are the iconic buyer for almost everyone. What attracts me? It doesn't attract me a tool feature. What attracts me is how do you help me to get into my pipeline more deals, more leads, more stuff, more running, more running uh, deals. That that's the gameplay I'm, I care about. So if you talk with me a language about tool features, something like that, maybe I'm not interested in that game. So that was that was the gameplay when they um, late in in nineties started to not talking about features anymore. Just just get to value based selling. What's the value of the persona? And the gameplay is all about find the iconic iconic buyer find a technical buyer and potentially a technical influencer. And it's called um, the PSP, the Problem Solution Benefit Statements, uh, which Product Marketing is very well known for. Product Marketing was, it's not, a, it's not a, um, an old department existing since many, many years. This is in 10, 12 years existing departments. You can ask Product Marketers, this is exactly their job. Watch the competition. What's relevant for this, for this persona? So the whole company needs to, needs to understand that's the persona we're targeting. That's the economy buyer. That's a technical buyer. Best case, you have a technical influencer like an architect, an IT architect, something like that. But you need to know what attracts them. You need to have the right content for the right people at the right time. So this means in which stage the content is, which that you use it. What I also saw on the market is uh, if you speak that language about an iconic buyer, you have also the salespeople talking the language, not only marketing, it's a go-to-market approach. So the product people, the marketing people, the salespeople have to work in one language to this iconic buyer, to this technical buyer. And it's the gameplay. It's a full approach of a company. It's just marketing. That's not enough. All of it have to run the same messaging. One voice to the customer sounds easy. It's not. Bigger the company is, it's quite hard, okay, to get everybody aligned to the game. And in startups, I can tell you, most people in startups and most products in the startups who are trying to get into enterprise, they're doing it wrong because they're not stating clearly who's the buyer. Who's the buyer persona for me? Who is the buyer? Who gets the budget? Who's the owner? Who, who runs the process? Nobody tells you that right now. So this is the gameplay first. Find out who's the, who's the buyer for my product, product market fit. Who's the buyer for my product? And what's the problem statement there? PSP, which gives you a clear value prop, value proposition. Because all three works together as a value proposition. If you have a clear defined with all teams together, three day session, all the workshop, outcome, we have a PSP, we know the buyers, we know the value prop, now run. Only adjust after six months, but run it. And then let's see how this sticks. That's the gameplay you get into that. To do that, you need to understand outside in. You need to speak the language. And potentially you need external consultants to help you with that. If you're in the financial industry, maybe you should ask for some financial people to help you with the language. To figure it out on your own could be quite hard, to be honest with you. Yeah, and so that's one of your other lessons. Trust and learn from others. And you were mentioning sometimes those others are external consultants, freelancers, these type of folks. So how did you learn this lesson? Um, it's a story which is longer longer ago, but it, I, I'm very happy with that. So we ha I had a CEO, you know, starting in my my first uh, first company after Novell, Elson Sales. Uh, the CEO was, I think so the company was size 80, 90, 100, 100 people. You always run into risk, get shut down because run out of money. It made he made money with the rain, but it got the growth was too fast and potentially too much higher. You ran twice into the same problem, potentially running out of money. And we didn't know that. He told me that in a, a two years later, in a, in a moment when he talked with me on a you know in, in, in a bar, talking with me about this whole thing. He said the learning lesson for him was to get out of this situation, to be running out of money, to listen to others. How they did that. Because he was an Austrian guy, he was not international, he was not international, very well known. So how to deal with it? And he had to learn how to listen to others that potentially they can help him to rescue the company. And that's what he did. He trusted 
put the, all the trust on others and get the, and, and use the help from others to get the company over the fence. At the end, the company got sold to uh, several investors. Uh, one was Carla, the other one was EQT, and then sold to CA. So it was very successful at the end. But the reason was he trusted and listened to others. And that's for some of my, my lessons I learned from. That's something um, is very important and very valuable. Listen to others. If you don't know this, if you don't know this area, for example, financial, if you don't know this area of marketing, maybe ask others. You learn from it. You trust this works, and then you learn from it, and you give the trust back to your team. They learn from it as well, and that's the gameplay. Trust and learn from others is a big, it's a big approach in management on my own team. And also learn from others is a big approach to learn from others, external consultants or external people, also other CMOs in a, in the business. Okay, so. I mean, I agree at a high level, like in hindsight, it's, it's a good thing to say too. But when you're talking about external consultants, how do you find and pick and partner with the right external consultants that you really can trust? Because let me tell you, I mean, anyone who has been in a pitch from consultants <laughs> or anyone who's even been earlier in the sales funnel when, you know, they're just reaching out to you on LinkedIn, sales, whatever they're doing, I mean, they will promise you the moon and, you know, I'm sure everyone's also had an experience where they trusted a consultant and got burned or just, you know, the consultant gave them information, but it was nothing they could really execute on. It was nothing that really had an impact on the business, right? It all sounded good in theory, but in practice where the rubber meets the road, it, it didn't really work out, right? So, so how do, is there anything you do when you're selecting an external consultant or a vendor in general to know, okay, how do you find that right person to trust or that right group, that right team? Yes, I do. They are. I, I agree with you. They're not only promising the moon, they're promising you to the universe if needed. So it's all good. <laughs> um, but my point is a different one. So first of all, you can test consultants. So I have, a, I have an experience uh, which I use a lot and I also use others to give me references of consultants and let me show their work. Okay, so I asked typical external consultant, show me the work you did and let me talk with somebody else. It's like a like an interview, to be honest with you, because it's an it's like an interview being hired. It's like an external consultant. Give me references I can talk with about my the, the projects you did there. And this gives you already a kind of 50, 60 percent chance that there's a good chance that you can hit the wall and just make that happen, this project. So this is the first thing. Ask them for references or ask somebody in your network because this is a big important part of, of, of CMOs in my mind, to build a big network you can ask for and ask others, what do you think? Do you have an idea how we can use? So that's the way we also found our HubSpot consulting company, which is awesome. Because I asked somebody else for a reference. Can you give me a reference uh, who integrated with you this thing? And they did, and we tested it. We give, we give a little project, we paid a little bit more. Sure, if you get more days, you would pay less. That's fine. But we tested that. I'm not putting more whole money on one consulting company for 12 months and just uh, have a problem to find another one because they could not deliver that. You start with small projects and you'll see how they deliver project management, project delivery in time. All this, all this, you know, these fancy things you can can monitor and watch. That's what we do. So don't trust 100%. Uh, don't deliver me the universe. Just deliver me the little country, okay? First, before you tell me that you can deliver me the whole universe. So you have to be careful. But that's how you build trust. If this is not working, go to the next one. There are enough on there. But if I go with one, I trust and put him as a teaching partner in my game because I'm not going away. So I'm a very, um, I'm 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 sitting with a partner for a long time, and I tell them. If you're doing a good job, I'm sitting with you for a long-term approach, not for a short-term, just get into it, just do this three, four, or five days or half year and then out. I'm sitting there for a long-term. That's what I tell them. So don't promise me, don't overpromise me anything. Tell me what you can do. And this gives already a clear understanding where I can go with them. And this gives me a clear understanding. They understand it or not. That's the way you can get the rubber. You said I hit the rubber on the road. That's the way it is. Test them. Test them, get references. Talk with someone who did projects with them. It's the best insights you can get. Great. And I think that that idea too of doing like kind of a proof of concept with them, a trial, ties into your next lesson. You say fail fast, fix fast, learn fast. So how have you done this in your career? Okay. So this first of all, I'm I'm coming from the DevOps space. So I did 10 years DevOps, um, especially in, in CA Broco and Atomic. Um, with this with Gardner Forrester. And one of the HR mythologies in development is fail fast, fix fast, learn fast. On a thought about if this works in software development, why doesn't it work in marketing? Why, why are we all scared about failing? Okay, so um, I'm not scared about failing. I'm, I love to fail because then I know that I don't sp overspend money on too much to some, to, too much on something and exactly what I'm doing. That's the reason I've said it from the beginning. I'm looking at data. 
because data tells me quickly I'm successful with it or not. Or let it a little bit more running because we see peaks in there running perfectly fine, but not there where we want it to be. So let's see, we can adjust a little bit more on this game. Maybe spend a little bit more on it. So fail fast means get an error culture in the team, get an error culture team. You can make errors, just course correct them and learn from it. So that's the gameplay in HR development as well. If you're doing, if you're doing something wrong, you create a bug in your software, you fail fast, but you're responsible to fix it. Wherever you are, if you've been a Caribbean island as a developer, it's still your responsibility to make it happen. And then learn from it. Don't do it a second time. For me, this is a big topic in marketing because marketing is all about we're creating projects, running it for six months. After six months, we're reviewing that. Wasn't a great approach. And why this divides my mind else is sales and marketing totally because sales sees the outside in messaging. Marketing is doing something for six months. They were so happy, created all these glancy, uh, you know, flyers and all that jazz. And they don't know about it. Nobody reads it. Nobody watches it. Nobody they get tons of downloads. Give you an understanding on it. They get tons of downloads. Say thousand downloads of a paper doesn't say anything to me. This is a download of a paper. Did somebody read up to page six or page seven at all? Do you know that? No, we don't. But we get downloads. Uh, that's a fail for me already. So guys, how do you get out of this? How do you? How do you? Why? Why you don't know what people are doing with it? Why you don't know? Are reading people? Are people reading this by the end? But who is that? Who's reading that? Do we have a lead gate in place? Do we need a lead gate? Can we figure it out a different way of getting people and, and, and understanding that? So for me, the fail fast, fix, fix fast, and, and learn fast approach is totally in marketing team uh, set up since the beginning. Um, I want them to fail fast and learn from it because if you create a new ebook, we don't know if this works. Same like you create content. You know it, but you don't know if it works. It's, it's, it looks glancy and fancy and all the stuff, and it's the best commercial. Nobody watches it. Tons of people downloading it. Nobody reads it. You sh you sh you you celebrating your success six months later, and the sales kick off, and sales tells you uh, this is not that great. Just telling you that now, six months later. So you already spent maybe a million, maybe six hundred k on a campaign, and you don't know anything about it. That's the gameplay of um, marketing. Seen sometimes as a t-shirt department or this kind of fancy swag swag and t-shirt and event department, instead of being a real business part of sales. So learn from that. That's my gameplay. And fail fast means listen to sales as well. Okay? All of it. Can you share any specific examples of where this happened in your career? You know, you talk about agile development. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> you know, waterfall was the previous development, right? The challenge was it was less iterative. Agile was that idea, like you said, of your, your learning. So I'll give you a quick example while you're thinking. I interviewed Julian Rio, the assistant vice president of international marketing for Ring Central on how I made it marketing. And one of his lessons was take risks, fail early, and learn fast. Kind of a similar lesson. And he talked about the key thing for him as a leader is how he plans his budget, right? One of the key things. And he takes the Pareto principle. 80% goes to his bread and butter. 20% goes to, like you said, those things where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experiment. Like if, if I'm never failing, I'm never really yes. pushing the envelope. I'm going to experiment. So for you, I mean, how do you manage in an agile way a marketing department? Do you have any specific examples how this came up in the past? Uh, yeah, I can tell it from my product marketing experience because I started in a product marketing career. Uh, so I moved in from sales into product marketing because of the outside in messaging was required by the advisor, let's say by the investor at that time. They asked me to do that. And the fun part of that, you know, we wanted to be a funny conversation. So I asked the first question, why should I leave sales when I'm being successful in sales? Why should I be in marketing? And she said something very, the, the advisor at that time, she said something very interesting. I still have this in my mind. It's almost 20 years ago. She said, do you want to use the other side of the brain as well? Uh, yes. So you should go in marketing as well. Get your creative part of the game as well running, not only the money number and the money crunching side of the, of the brain. So that was funny. So she said that really, that attracted me by the way. So we used the whole brain, not just one part of it. Um, and the gameplay for me, I can tell you that when I got in product marketing, um, I got a task for running a campaign sub, and I was very, this was very successful with Oracle. It's called Oracle Financial Automation. We did this very well. We did, we had a solution in place and he said to me, build a campaign for SAP Financial Automation. So SAP, the other vendor, the counterpart of Oracle at the time, is that we don't have a product for that. Yeah, I know, but let's run the campaign. And I, my biggest mistake, to, my biggest mistake at the time was to say no. We're not doing it. It doesn't make any sense to me to run that. So we trained sales. We trained the marketing team. We trained everybody on SAP Financial Automation. We got everything running. And we got also customer interested, but we could not deliver. So at that time, I should say, shut it down. Okay? 
And I didn't, I didn't do that. It was a big mistake because I had to deal with that for two years in a row. Instead of running this down in three, four months, guys, we cannot deliver against the, 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 the wishes from the customer. We risk potentially the image of the company by doing that. Okay. We, uh, we will build something when this is coming up. No, we're not building something quickly when this is running up because the marketing campaign is successful. So the fun part is the campaign was successful, but it was still a fail because we could not deliver as a company. So for me, there was a clear fail in all directions, not only marketing, also sales um, and the product side of it, which is to go to market. And to be honest with you, that was one of my biggest mistakes. I did not take that lesson to, to my heart. Fail fast, fix fast, learn fast. Fix fast, within this case, shut it down. Shut it down, learn from it, don't do it again, okay? And that was something which hit me very, very hard that I did not do that. And I can tell you with my, with my knowledge today of how this fix fast, learn fast, and uh, learn and fix fast, fail fast, fail fast, fix fast, learn fast, now we get it. Um, <laughs> with this approach, with this approach, I would never ever start this campaign. That, that's a big learning for me. So yes, there is always something behind the story why you're thinking of things because you learned it a different way and you learn it hard. Because you know how it's like a kid. Don't touch, don't touch it. It's hot. You touch it because it's hot as a kid. It's just like the same like if you experiment with something, you touch it. But I'll let my people or the teams or the teams I'll report to me, I'll let them touch that. I said, it's hot. Try it out. If you get around this, fine. Then if not, fix it and then learn from it. Don't do it again. So I let them to our culture to learn from it because I, I did not say no to my CMO at that time. And I should say no from the beginning. And there was a fail for me. That's the gameplay. So it's kind of learnings behind the story. There are more than, more than one story. Um, and I'm happy about it. Every, every, every fail I'm happy with because this gives me a clear understanding. We understand our job. And then, and then we all get to learn from it too. So thank you for sharing it. Uh, so but that, that brings up a fascinating question. So in you know, fast-moving companies, in startups, in technology companies, there is often a push to try to market and sell things that aren't necessarily fully baked yet. Maybe we'll sell it and then we'll get services to come in and you know finish developing the other 50% of it once we sell it. Um, or you know, you're know you just moving quick as a company or trying to add an AI, add an automation, whatever it is. So is there something you do as a marketer to kind of vet out how ready you think, how baked you think something is and when it is ready to go to market, like as you're working with the rest of the company? Because as you mentioned, you know, there's all these different touch points you were mentioning before that we have that the customer has with the company. So yes, everyone has to be on the same page and communicating the right thing. But at the end of the day, we're responsible for the brand. We're responsible for how the company is perceived in the marketplace. The product has to deliver, right? It has to deliver whatever Correct. value Correct. proposition we state. So have you learned anything in your career? You have a more technical background than maybe some other marketers of how to like so, kind of vet out this is this is ready for ready to go to market. Yeah. So what I'm what, what I'm doing. Okay. One of my approaches, um, that's the reason I'm not, I'm not a CMO for early, early, early pre, pre, pre seed startups. Cause the question, the MVP, the minimal viral product first, what are you, what are we delivering? Potentially MVP goes away. You remember MVP is just to test the market. It's not a PMF product. It's not a product market fit product. So it's not really solving a problem. It's just finding the way off. We know we have a potential, but let's do an MVP and let's see if you can, you can, go from there, which is an experiment thing. I'm not typical at that kind of level because um, I start with a PSP. What's the problem? What's the solution for the benefit? The MVP is good enough for that, typically. As, uh, other than that, just an experimenting and maybe go left, right, and taunt. It, that, you can't do marketing with that. It's just put your features out there because marketing means you stick on a message, you run the message for at least six months, and you cannot change it every hour doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Because, you, oh, no, we're doing this. This is kind of the, I explained a little bit the, the squirrel on the tree. Oh, the squirrel's not there. Oh, the squirrel's there. Oh, the squirrel's up there. Oh, the squirrel's down there. You can't right. do marketing this way. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. They do feature marketing, do a PLG, a product, product like growth, putting on GT something or something. That's okay. I, I'm not worried about it. But uh, what I'm going is, is value-based selling enterprise level. This is my approach in, as a CMO. I'm running enterprise sale. I'm running enterprise business, which means higher, higher deal sales, like, but a clear buyer persona, a clear problem. It could be an MVP. I'm not, I'm not questioning there's a product market fit. The MVP could be there. But less than an MVP, that's a problem because then it's a feature thing. And then you're talking about a 3K deal, 2K deal, 1K deal. And my question is, why do you need marketing for that? Right. Then just do 
somebody can do something could be the the the, the, the owner or some help from external consulting or an agency can do that build up the website these are the features but you don't need a clear marketing strategy behind the story you don't because marketing means for me you run a full problem solution benefit which gives you a value prop with clear buyer personas and then you're in marketing for six months not changing every time the messaging because now the whole company is on the left tree on the top tree on the right tree on the below on the bush on the side it doesn't work it's clear defined messaging and that's what you get also branding out there because how do you get branding out there with absolutely no clear messaging what does the brand stand for Ah, oh, we don't know where, wherever the squirrel goes, right? This, this doesn't make any sense to me. So people are uh, people have tend to add marketing into the game way too early. Market, this is not marketing at that level. They're doing this way too early. And if you're ready, you're in between MVP. You know, you know potentially exactly what the problem, not 100% what the problem is, because you need to figure out. Then you start getting product marketing people in place, which is for me the first hire before doing a product manager is the product marketing. What's your competition? Get your clear understanding of the competition. Watch the market clear. What's going? On. You see that? Uh, it's, it's funny. Um, the point is, the point is for me, um, get the understand, get the understanding. What's possible in the market? What's the competition? What are they doing? And to be honest with you, marketing can also steal messaging. I don't have to worry about that. If somebody else is great in, mess, in, in marketing, why not? Competition is not bad. You should only be better than competition if you come to a, a, to a product level. So you. The goal, the goal of marketing is not to be only number one. There's nobody else. Be at least one of the top three. That's your gameplay. And being part of that POC at the customer sites. That's what you're striving for. And then be better in this POC. Be better pre-sales. Be a product, not a consulting gig for the next 12 months. That's the gameplay for, for the whole thing. And that's what I would look into when I go into marketing uh, and, and, and watch startups. This is the main problem. Most investors, most most startup CEOs uh, don't know their PMF. Don't know the pro their their product, um, the PSP, their PNS, their product market fit. They don't know, and also they don't know their PSP. And do they need help with that? Absolutely, but sometimes it's too early because they don't know where they're going with the product. All so right. it's important. Well, answer answer easy, Daniel. Yes, you need a PMF or an MVP to at least solve a problem, something which is there, right? Right. And just real quick to build on what you're saying with the squirrel problem, I assume you're talking about that because there's only so many opportunities you have to break through the noise to get through the customer. And if you keep telling a different message each time, you're not really going to sit in the customer's mind. Is that kind of one of the reasons with the squirrel problem of like kind of just shooting all over the place about which changing what the value proposition of the company is? Uh, um, yeah, it's, you can see this in sales as well. I, I was taught in sales. You're throwing stones, hopefully hit the right buyers and hopefully you get the right message from the buyer. That doesn't work. Potentially the might... Um, there's a there's a something for I think it was force management with a it's a big company in sales training sales management. Think like a, you have a wall in front of you and you being the sales guy. Somewhere behind the wall is the buyer. You know the first for, for, you throw the first stone, first messaging. You don't hit him. Second second stone, third stone. Potentially the buyer is gone because he doesn't listen to you behind the wall anymore because he's gone. He doesn't care about you anymore because you change messaging all the time. So what are you solving? What are you solving for him? Sales already have this problem. Guess what? Marketing, which don't know the buyer, how marketing has this problem because if they're changing all the time, what are what are what does your brand stand for? That's a huge problem in the market. If you're not changing all the all the directions all the time, this is I know it's uh, more a picture of the squirrel, but you know a squirrel runs around the trees. The same thing in marketing. If the sales already has the problem to get three different messaging to the same buyer out, and you don't know what you stand for, how is marketing doing that without knowing the customer? If, which is anonymous. Remember, is anonymous sign up for something like a demo, like a PDF, like whatever, is anonymous. If you change message to the same person all the time again, maybe it makes no sense to do marketing. Exactly. Uh, well, thanks. So, uh, Ralph just shared some lessons uh, that he learned from the things he made in marketing. In just a moment, we're going to ask him about some of the lessons he learned from the people he collaborated with. That's a great thing we get to do as marketers, not just make things, we make them with other people. But first, I should mention that the How I Made It in Marketing podcast is underwritten by MechLabs Institute, the parent organization of Marketing Sherpa. You can get 10,000 marketing experiments working for you with a free trial of the MechLabs AI Guild at mechlabs.com slash AI. That's M-E-C-L-A-B-S dot com slash AI. Uh, all right. So let's, as I mentioned, let's talk about some lessons you learned from the people you collaborate with. You said nothing counts more than the language of the customer. You learned this from Michelle Fitzpatrick, an advisor for UC4. 
Uh, this is something we've been talking about, but I think this is how you first broke from sales to marketing, right? Was was part of this lesson from Michelle. Yeah, this, she's a lady who brought up that uh, thinking about use your other side of the brain. She was that lady. And I'm very happy about that, that she did that with me. Uh, she was already a advisor. I think she was an SVP of Oracle at that time uh, or before that time. So she got all that uh, insights of sales, how to sell, how to talk with a customer. I did as well. And I didn't understand what she wants from the beginning because I was successful sales. So why should I move? And then she explained it to me. I need you to train and teach people inside of the company how to talk this language because they don't know. They're talking about their feature. They're talking about a feature presentation. That's was exactly the gameplay. What I got as enterprise sales was a feature presentation. And how do you sell a feature uh, for a half million or a million to a, to a, to a customer? It doesn't work. Nobody, as again, um, in the leadership level, cares about features. Nobody does. Still not, by the way. It doesn't, didn't change over the years. So they don't care about it. So what she clearly identified as a, as a huge gap in the company was, I need somebody, or at least, Three people, it was three people starting with me in this role, one out of pre-sales, one out of consulting, and one out of sales, which was me sales. One in pre-sales and one in consulting. She just put all out of, uh, all together as a department called product marketing, which is kind of new at that time. It's not new these days anymore. But she asked before, okay, I need somebody who watches the competition, gets the messaging in place, gets the outstanding messaging, and train the sales on how to sell that. So that's what she wanted from a technical level, consulting level, and from a, from a sales level. And that's what she did to me. So she made that move uh, in my head as well from a sales role into a marketing role. Start product marketing. It's not a bad start, but you understand better than the competitive play and the, the messaging play, what you can do as the CMO. So um, you've mentioned product marketing fit a lot. You've mentioned about getting that message right a lot. So I wonder what has worked for you? Do you have any tips of what has worked for you to actually identify that product market fit, to identify that problem solution messaging, right? That, that is the gold. You talk about, you know, teaching this to sales, training sales, this, I used to work in sales enablement. I know a big challenge when you're training sales is kind of, you mentioned with the two sides of the brain, they're very quota focused, right? They're very focused on hitting their number as they should be. They're very focused on the relationship with the customer. So it is very difficult to catch their attention and tell them, hey, this is the right thing, unless they have a firm understanding and belief in you, that trust element, that, hey, this is actually going to work, right? So what have you done to kind of build that credibility, to get that understanding, to identify and dig and find that product market fit and find that right messaging? Yeah, the fun part of that game, and I tell a little bit about it, Dan, because the solution is still existing. Um, I built a solution um, out of the brain together with a consultant uh, internally, two people. We created, a, we created a solution which fit into every SAP customer, and nobody trusted us nobody, internally. Customer, not a problem. First webinar was full by 400 people. It was easy to do it. It was a real problem. We just did one webinar in Germany and got 400 people with almost every SAP customer was in our webinar. And sales, what are we selling here? What's the solution here? I, I don't understand that. So we did this without sales, just tested it out. Okay, they didn't figure it out. The customer after the webinar reached out to them and said, hey, what, what's the cost of that? We didn't talk about it. By the way, we had no solution. We just did messaging, okay? We just tested. And the gameplay was that every sales want me on this call with the customer because the reason is I was a sales. I know, I know the language. I know what they're thinking about. I know what their quota are thinking. I know they're, I need to get this in this fiscal year. I get the pressure of forecast. I committed something. I upside something. All this chest. You know, it, it is what it is in sales, right? Commit an upside. And I said, you can make that quota just stand alone with the solution if you're doing this right. And I said, okay, let's get for one meeting. And this one meeting helped them not to cover that full OTE and all that stuff, but it helped them to, uh, to achieve that. And if you helped them to achieve their goal, their quota, you'd get the trust level you would not expect because that's the gameplay. And it's the only gameplay you can get. If you just trade another flyer, hey, just sell that for me, that doesn't work. You need to be with them on the road. As you said, I hit the rubber on the road, right? So we be with them at the customer side. Get the blame, get everything back, and just, hey, um, work on that solution. Work better, do it better, learn from it, do a better presentation, and uh, do everything to make it happen. And we did this for the whole uh, product suite we had in place. So we, we learned from every customer. We also created another solution, which called release automation. That's the reason for DevOps. Um, we were being really bad in the beginning really bad. We didn't know the other players in the market. And we listened up. We listened to our customer. What do you want? 
what do you want to accept? What do you want? To accept? What, what do you want? Not just features. Of what do you want to achieve in the game? So we got higher in the, in the chain. And we got higher in the level, and then we talked with these people like a partner, and they accepted me. Anyway, I had product marketing standing on my or director product marketing standing on my my business card. They accepted me as a partner, not not only the salespeople, as the customer side, because oh, he speaks my language, and that's a big difference. If you're being just there as a CMO or a product marketing leader, they will tell you, ah, just another marketing guy. The other one, just another sales guy. You know who's got most trusted in a, in this sales situation? The pre-sales guys, because they're technical. They're not they're not trying to sell me something, which is the biggest lie. Every pre-sales is on Kuda, <laughs> huh? but you know, pre-sales is most trusted person in that in that area, but only if you're technical people there. So, if you want to be trusted. The sales in the sales name has to speak the langu language that I do, but not in the deep detail I do. So what was the case is that you speak the language, you help sales to sell actively in their deal. Not sitting there and just waiting for what's happening, that's not working. That is not working. If you want to get something out, you want to get a PMF out there, you need to listen to what people are doing with it and what people want to achieve that. It's not only the product people, not only the, the sales people or the pre-sales people, also the marketing people have to listen in actively in the customer situations. That's that's big differentiator. And you mentioned the webinar you filled with 400 people because you found the right problem. Is that how you found that problem from your time in sales actually actively talking to customers? This was this was in product marketing. Um, we found this actively because I was talking, I can't, can't tell you the name of the customer. It was a German customer, very well yeah, sure. known for, very well known uh, big business. And I talked with them. Um, and they told me, we have this distance problem. Why can you not solve that? What are you talking about? It was really kind of a weird coffee, cookie session thing, right? And he started a, he started this $50 million business with that with that question. Can you help me to do that? Okay, so not not that bad for a coffee cookie session. Not that bad. A coffee cookie session for me just, hey, you're talking with a customer, a partner, you're doing some coffee cookie session, you know, relationship pieces, customer relation, then move out. No sell. It's just relationship okay so i call this cnc appointments which is fine they are sometimes needed and this one started it because he said can we do something so i took this idea back to a consultant in the sp consulting space what do you think yeah but we need some help so let's let me figure out how to do that and we used the customer for the first webinar talking about our solution which never existed never ex the customer talked for us at that webinar what he what he tries to achieve and everybody was just yes that's exactly what we want so we got a proof that's a real problem by doing this webinar sales was not involved but a gameplay that's it's a it's a unique thing and i think that's this is most needed that you listen to your customer what could potentially be the problem and i think that what we're doing right now is the same thing they listened over the last three years what's the problem and then find a product market and now sell that thing but on a high valuable level. So PSP, everything comes in play. And that's the gameplay for everyone. So you want to listen to that? Uh, you need to listen to the customer. If you listen to the customer, you can help sales. Other than that, uh, sales doesn't care about you. Just <laughs> No, that's that's true. But so it sounds like FaceTime with the customer. It sounds like that's what you're saying. I mean, sales is more known for having that FaceTime with the customer than marketing. But it sounds like, are, is that something you try to actively do in your career? And you manage your team as a marketer, have that FaceTime, that direct interaction with the customer to to find that product market fit, to find these problems. Yes, I can tell you. Yes, it is. So my first okay. job on my first job on marketing and XTI was go to a big event. I think it was the big first first big event for for, for XTI, which is knowledge. Knowledge is the biggest event for to service our customers. I wanted to be there. I had to talk with my wife. She will listen to the podcast as well. I did to talk with my <laughs> wife because it was a planned holiday in that time frame. I said, I want to be there. I want to talk with customers. I want to tell, I want to understand the problem because this isn't my DNA. I want to understand, I want to listen to them, not only internal, inside out, right? I want to listen to them. And that knowledge, this three days just tuned up the whole thing, to be honest with you. And that's the gameplay I'm, I'm looking all the time. So. Are you trying to achieve that? Are you trying to do this? I try. We had a chance of talking with, uh, out of 50,000 people, talking with 800 people to just fix the problem and figure out, is this the right problem? Is this the right problem solution benefit? Is this beneficial for you with me doing this? And they're telling you straight into your, into your face, yes, it is. Or, ah, I don't care. Oh, it's low level. It's okay. They tell you that because you asked the question. They did tell you that, especially in the US, US market. They tell you that. If you're doing the same with the German market, I can tell you they don't tell you that. To tell you that potentially afterwards, or they never tell you, but they talk about you in the back. 
Okay, <laughs> that's a that's a different thing in Germany, but I know how to hit them or how to get them on, on board. So uh, it's a different thing. But the US, they tell you, and that's the good news on the US market, they tell you exactly what the problem is, but you need to ask the question. Don't be don't be ashamed to ask this question. Just do it. Just ask why. What are you doing? What's the value you're seeing there? Is this of value? And you question your own software. A question your own software. Is this of value? If no, guys, we're not hitting the nail. <laughs> All of you. All of you in the company. You're not hitting the nail. Nobody cares about you. Ask this bad question. Because then you know that you fail right now before you figure it out in one year. Okay? Ask the question now. So for me, this was most important to get uh, to these events and learn from that query from customers. Also, customer facing by remote, more soon and all that. I would love to do more, but I had to cre create a marketing department here. This was more or less um, my, my gameplay right now. I get more and more back. We are again on, on forums, on events with, with teams. Uh, we learn again, we are, we are adjusting all the time messaging. We're not changing. We're not doing the squirrel thing. We just go straight. <laughs> yeah. and we are doing adjusting it. A little bit left, a little bit right, but not go over all over the place and just hopefully something sticks. That's that's over. Since we did this in event in May, this is over. We, we fixed it, adjusted a little bit every six months, but not more. And we want to run it for a while. This gives you a brand name. This gives you clear messaging. It gives you a clear website. It gives you a clear, it gives you a clear problem solution benefit. It gives you what gives you else well, who's the buyer for that. So yes, I'm, I'm talking with customers as much as I would like. Um, I would do more, more and more and more. Absolutely. Yeah, I love what you said. I love what you said too. That sometimes it's it is a problem they have. It is a solution, but it's low level. It's not that important. That's another thing to hear and to understand from the customer, right? Because that that makes things very difficult when it comes to actually is, selling and marketing. There's another one which I just want to tell you. Also, the order. If you want to go into the feature discussion, there's nothing. There's something else people don't don't understand. Um, it's happened since the Mercury times, so a long time now. So the Mercury was acquired by a few years ago. What they did very well is they defined what is the top number one feature if I show something in a POC, what at a pre sales team or something? What's the top number one? What's the top two? What's top three, top four, top five? After top five, stop it. I know you can talk about another 30 features. You love that features. It's all great. Don't care about them. Yep. The order of the feature, how you present that is important. What is the value of each feature based on the value you deliver back to the economy buyers? So if you're talking about technical buyers, technical influencers, that's the order how you present it at any time. There's no choice for pre-sales. That's how you present it all the time. Because it's the order of, is this, a, is this a low level value or is it a high level value? If you're doing this wrong, you lose the customer in the POC or you lose the customer in a demo. And that's a bad thing. That also need to get product marketing or marketing needs to get some control in that. This is what we message in a POC. It's not going away. So this is also what we care about. Yeah, so I love your examples of actual face-to-face, -face getting out there and talking to people. Uh, but you also mentioned use data to make informative decisions. Obviously, as you said, we've got all this data coming into our websites from people uh, and in other places. You learned this from Chris Borman, the former CEO of Atomic. How did you learn this from Chris? Uh, Chris was a CMO. Uh, at Atomic, and he did. Um, he was a CMO at Salesforce. He was a CMO at Informatica, which are big companies. And he's a Salesforce. He was a Salesforce geek. He looked tons of analytics and dashboards. I don't know how much dashboards he created to get an overview of what's going on at the company. And I lost that that view, to be honest with you, because he did so much analytics on that game. Um, what he taught me was very interesting. That. Uh, he wants to get, he also was the guy who designed SOP financial automation, which I said should say no at the time. He accepted it, by the way, after the other said, yeah, right, was wrong. Okay. <laughs> his, data, his data said that as well. So great guy, learned a lot from him, especially on getting understanding how your department works and where to spend the marketing budget to get the most out of it. And that's what he did. He looked in the data inside and said, okay, this campaign doesn't work. Let's go to the next campaign. So we did uh, free product lines. Okay. Which works? What is the growth area on the product line? So we had a product growth, um, product growth, a line for product growth, a line for line kind of growth, and a big line for uh, future growth, which is um, approaching crossing the chasm. Crossing chasm is chasm one, chasm two, chasm three. Some Trophy Moore, I would everybody recommend reading this book when you want to get a startup um, in place and want to get sell high um, in the enterprise level. But this is the gameplay, so you need to understand. Wait, 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 what's that book called, real quick? Crossing the Chasm from Trophy Moore, uh, okay. very old. I think so it's already 15 years on the market. Um, 
but it helps you to get in the startup in the startup business. What's the PMF on Casm One? Get the land, land two to 20, 15, 20 logos, then go to scale mode, uh, how to get to 100, 150 logos, and then again to um, just upsell into the same game. That's the Casm One, Casm Two, Casm Three approach. And we had this kind of definitions in our products. We had one, we saw a Casm Three, which is upsell, 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 okay? The, the second part was, the second product was, um, uh, Casm 2, which is, it's good, it's okay, move on, let's make it bigger. Not only upsell out to new logos. And Casm 1 was, okay, potential growth in the future. And all this free spend money on marketing budgets. So where do you want to see the biggest growth in the company? Where do you see the biggest uh, strategic approach? And do you make a decision on where to put the money on? And if it doesn't work, if something doesn't work, you need to figure out quickly, so where to move the money? Where to get the most out of the, for the company? And that's what he did. And I think so that... He was the only one at that time who got full data insights, which leads, velocity of a lead, when it's MQL, how many SELs, how many SQLs, and he also was able to align with the sales, sales CSO, or the CSO chief sales officer, very closely. I never seen a CMO doing this this, this well, because he showed he was very transparent with his data to the CSO and back and forth. These guys worked very closely together with one pipeline. No discussion, no heavy discussions, no uh, finger pointing, which is most cases in sales marketing happen these days. There was no finger pointing. So I, I learned from it a big amount that this is one team. Anyway, you call it marketing sales, this is one team on the pipeline. I go much harder. I'm not looking for MQL. So I'm, I'm listening I'm listening what he said over years. Doesn't mean I'm doing everything he said. So this one doesn't mean I count MQL as a velocity of a subscriber to a lead to an MQL to whatever pick and choose. Yeah, all the KPIs out there uh, and the CAC and what, how many, how many impressions? What's the website? Blah blah. I can tell you, I don't care about the statistics. I only see something's dropping, something's going up. This works. This doesn't work. This I care about. Call whatever you like the KPIs. At the end, it needs to be a deal on the pipeline. That's what I count. What's the timeline from here? From, from the beginning to the end, being a deal in the pipeline, which you can progress from there, influence that. From a marketing perspective, it also gets sales up and running with the deal. Does it care about? But Grace gave me that understanding, and it also gives an understanding, hey, you could be a CMO in the future. And I said, ah, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't trust that. By the way, he would laugh about it if he hears the podcast, and I know he, he listened to Marketing Share as well. I'm not telling that up front. You, will, you get told by someone. Um, he will, he will listen to that and will tell him, ah, you're right, Chris, I'm a CMO now. So he said to me, you could become a CMO if you're doing this right and understanding marketing full detail and not on the product marketing side, you become a CMO. And I said, ah, there's no way I can go up the ladder and look what, look what happened over the last years. It is possible. There you go. He was right. Uh, so we talk about using data to make an informed decision. You mentioned a lot of the metrics you don't care about, I understand. Um, but can you give me a specific example of how you do use data to inform a decision? Because a lot of those metrics, I know you're talking about informing a deal, but a lot of those metrics could be helpful earlier because they can give a trend of where things are going earlier in the funnel, earlier in the pipeline to get things in the right direction. And just while you're thinking, I'll give you one quick example I love um, of a data-driven marketing decision. Um, you talked a lot about, which I also agree with, let's not be a squirrel, let's not go all over the place. But sometimes we do have to pivot as organizations. One of the biggest time I can think of is COVID, caused a lot of companies to pivot. I wrote a case study with a company that made tents for concerts, right? So, oh my gosh, during COVID, their, all of their <laughs> business went away. So they looked into data, they, they uncovered some data, and they found uh, hospital administrators, actually. And then they started selling to hospital administrators these same tents for, that you're using for concerts, and they sold them to hospital administrators for COVID testing sites and vaccination sites, right? So again, they had a very clear plan <laughs> on where they were going. Things in the macroeconomic environment changed. They had to use data to pivot and sh shift to something else. So do you have an example? You mentioned using data to make informative decisions. What example in your career where it was like, well, so impactful. I used the data and helped lead to this decision that then you know, had an impact ultimately on closing a deal. Or many. Uh, I can, yeah, I can I can tell you many examples of that. So data insights, for example, um, I can do it as an actual for the actual company as well. So let's let's make that. I, I build up the customer journey here. Customer journey is typically how do we deal with a customer from subscriber, subscribe for something, did a form submission, or upload data, you know, the kind of uh, acquired lists on the market, which we didn't do. I'm not a fan of that. But get the data in place and now you send emails marketing out, you get people engaged with SDRs and all that stuff. So this is the engagement score. Sometimes the score, how engaged they are, become a subscriber, become a lead, become an MQL, and so on and so forth. 
And anyway, anyhow, I don't measure that from a, from a perspective, how many subscribers do we have, how many leads do we have, because they have a specific score now, they call it leads, now they have a specific score, they call it MQLs, now hand it over to SDRs, making the sales qualified. This is a marketing speech, right? What I care about is how engaged are they? And that's become with a score, because if you're more engaged, you get a higher score. By the way, it's the same what you define in a subscriber because subscriber is a 10 or lead is a 30 or you get five scores, five points for being on the website. You're going there. This is a kind of marketing thing. I'm interested in engagement of customers and that's the data I'm looking for. Are they engaged with the last email? Are they engaged with my video I set up? Is they already engaged with my demo tour I set up? My instant demo, they get, get there. Are they engaged with it? How long are they, re how long they are watching it? Um, how long they are, re how much are they reading my, uh, and I'm not using PDF, so I'm, I'm maybe I'm unusual, not normal for that pace, but I'm not having any PDFs in the company, not, not one. Because I, as I said, 1,000 downloads doesn't mean the PDF is value available. But I've used content management tools, so I know exactly when I create that ebook, I can watch people get to the last page and 100 people started in the, in the beginning and 80 people are left in the, at the end. It's a very successful one. So I know exactly what they read, how long, how many minutes, everything. I know exactly what they did. So I'm very data driven off. Is this ebook relevant? Are we updating this ebook? Are we using that still? Are we using this more? Are we doing campaigns around this ebook? Are we adding more, more pieces to it? This is the kind of play I'm getting. Are we adding a lead gate? Because I'm a big fan of open, open content. The reason is quite easy because of people not not tempting to sign up anymore. Because they got the Instagram reel, they got the YouTube reels, they get the TikTok channels. There's all free content. So why should I sign up on an, on an X type or whatever company you mentioned? They're not willing to sign up anymore. So you have to give free content. To give free content, you need to know what they're interested in. And if they are more interested, then you do the sign up. So make it ready for signing up. And then the engagement score goes quickly high. So what I test, if I put an ebook out, lead gate in the front. Maybe the lead gate in page four out of page eight, page three, page six. So I can move the lead gate wherever I want to see if the interest is still there. If they're signing up, successful. If not, maybe I open it up. If they stick with the 100 people still on the, on the ebook, it's successful, but not good enough for moving on with me. Not subscribing. Do I know how they, uh, who they are? Yes, I do because I send email marketing out, so I know exactly from the tracking perspective who they are and what, what's watching my my content. So that's the gameplay. It's marketing is so much big butter these days. It is so, and that's the gameplay how to get people converted into a deal. And that's the data I'm watching. How many people? How many people watch very specific content? What's the lead scoring? So the the, the engagement score call it engagement score, in this case it's called HubSpot, in this case, but engagement score, what's engagement score, how long did they do the demo tours, so I have an interactive tour on, on, this, on the website, I can tell you exactly what they did. Anyway, they never signed up for it, okay, because I sent them an email and this email in, integrates, definitely, this is a normal tactic, integrates uh, Daniel Burstein's email, and if Daniel goes to my product tour, I know exactly you did this, you did this, you got to the end, and then you bet potentially get an engagement score. Hey, you looked my whole product tour, he was interested in the whole product, you stick with that for 10 minutes, potentially one of my SDRs reaching out. Okay? Yeah. That's the gameplay. Well, I love where, you t I think this is a very customer first practice where you talk about putting the ask of the customer's information later into the customer journey, which I think is great. I think sometimes we're so company focused that it's like, boom, we just want to hit them right away. We want to get that information, which they are paying. They're paying with their information. Then we call that a lead. Then it's like, look at all these leads we got, right? <laughs> Versus, I mean, I love that approach you're talking about. It's you know, a, a content marketing approach or any marketing approach is where in the customer journey, do they have to make a payment? Of course, a payment with cash or signing contract or whatever, but also a payment with their, their information. And it should yeah. be, to your point, after they've received enough value that they want to, right? I mean, why would we hit them with that right away before they even know? And most people do, because if you want to, I can tell you from marketing, I, it's a buy out of marketing tech stack, tools in the marketing tech stack. Um, I could hit immediately. I mean, I got to a chat yeah. robot. Hey, you want to get a, you want to get an appointment? <laughs> no, guys, just want to get content. Demo, you That's, want a demo? Come on. on. Sign up here. Sign up here. Sign up here. No, yeah, yeah. I move away. Guys, this is not how the customer journey works these days. It just doesn't. Okay? We do but it as well, but we are, we are adjusting it uh, based on the needs from what we see from a data perspective. Let me also ask you, it sounded like in the beginning you were saying that you don't buy lists. Is that right? Or correct. did I hear you wrong? Correct. You know, correct. Okay. You're absolutely so, correct. 
Yeah, so let me ask you, because uh, I have this conversation with marketers all the time. I feel like they buy lists because, uh-oh, they need to hit a number this quarter and what else are they going to do? So they'll just buy a list and spam it out. <laughs> I heard that as well. <laughs> yeah, so so in your situation, so it sounds, I mean, you have obviously a long-term engagement play um, and you're not taking that short-term approach, but like, do you have any advice for them when, for lack of a better word, you know, you're just up against it and you need something that quarter and you need to push things out and, you know, obviously buying okay. a list seems so tantalizing? Uh, buying a list. Okay, let's let's define that a little bit more. Uh, buying a list means you're buying from a stranger around the world and a CSV file. Potentially good or not good, you don't know until you get it. Anyway, the samples could be great. They're not getting it. So uh, there are enough tools out there. It gives you a context based on technologies. We are looking for service, not technologies, especially at X time. So we had the same problem. Organic growth of a contact can take for, can take you a while, <laughs> especially the theme of people getting not signing up. Buying a list is not a solution because buying a list could also include, and that's the reason I'm not believing in that, it's a compliance issue as well because you can have honeypot addresses in there which just some lawyers build out, edit somehow, and you're doing a mistake and just send it to them outside of the US, especially in the European area or Canada or somewhere which is an opt-in country, you don't have consent with the customer. If you send a marketing email out to that and you being a, you have a honeypot email address from a lawyer in there, maybe you get sued for that thing. So it's it's not worth it's not worth doing that. So, but there are other ways of doing that, and there are enough tools in the market that give you that context based on filters, based on the level of technologies, based on title, based on countries. And we we said we want to be in the U.S. and U.S. is an opt-out country. This means I can send emails to anyone in the U.S. They can opt out. So I have the procedure in place for Can Spam Act and for the CCPA compliance perspective and everything. So I also GDPR compliance. We have to, this was the first thing I put in place. Uploading a list doesn't solve the problem. You need to get a compliance process in place so somebody can unsubscribe, he's unsubscribed from all systems. There is, there's no discussion on that. So this is also why, by the way, I listen to external people uh, listen to people I know from the past who did that in my in my companies where I worked before. So I, I asked them, said, how do you solve that in the US? How do you solve that in Canada? How do you solve that? It was a six weeks project before we put any contact in the database. But there are tools out there, and I'm not mentioning them here, which gives you that a direct import into HubSpot, which you can you can sign up a contract, you pay for this. It's an ongoing annual subscription. It's a software business, not a Excel CSV file business, which is my mind, my mind strange, but you can utilize them. And also if somebody opts out by you, they opt out by them as well. So it's a very secure way of doing that. And there's, and, and most marketers know what I'm talking about because this, this contact database exists since a while now, and it's the best way to hold compliance back because this is the biggest hit that uh, any marketing automation tool, if it's Marketo, Eloqua or HubSpot is shutting you down if you have too much bounces. If you have too much unsubscribes, they're shutting you down potentially for a while, or your domain is get blocked by email providers on the customer side and all that stuff. So you have to be very careful what you're doing, especially if contact lists you don't know where they come from. So I'm not buying lists, but at the same time, I'm not allowing any one of the teams besides the super admins to, to import or export lists out of HubSpot or any kind of map tool, market automation tool. So that's the gameplay. So be very strict with data. But we said clearly, we cannot do this with organic growth. We will be killed that. People are not signing up anymore. You cannot get a big list out quickly. Most companies I know, they build organic lists. And they, at the end, by talking about 300, 300 contacts, they're happy to do every time a marketing email. Uh, we got it from almost 500 up to several, um, almost 100,000 contacts in, in time. That's the gameplay in between two months. But for that, you need to get compliance in place. That's the, that's the first thing you need to do. This is my only advice I can give people. Don't give up. There are enough uh, capabilities in the market, but you need to do your homework 100% first before you add anything to your HubSpot data because that can kill you. If you're doing it wrong, it can kill you. That's the point. It can kill you by bounces, HubSpot shutting you down. Um, it can kill you. Wrong lawyer address, honeypot <laughs> email address. It could, could be anything. could shut it down. We don't run into this risk anymore. We just get to the risk. We just added that, and now we are fine. Okay, that gives me also the chance to target marketing because I can define, hey, let's take on a buyer. That's a technical buyer. I figured it out on my contact database. That's my top 2,000 concentrated on as a company. So give me all the economy buyer, technical buyer, and potentially have 2,000 economy buyers and 2,000 um, technical buyers. And I do very targeted messaging for the economy buyer, which is a different content to the technical buyer at the beginning. If it's later in the stage, maybe adding different content to the technical and different content to the economy buyer. But for that, I need to do the PSP 
the messaging and the value prop first to know and understand what is for each, what is in for each of them, which means outside messaging, outside messaging for both. That's the gameplay, Daniel. Well, let's talk about the gameplay for the entire company itself. Uh, you say you learned about selling a division by defining strategy for the company. You learned this from Craig Bettis, the CA, CEO of Hadion. So how did you learn how to sell a vision by defining the strategy for the company from Craig? And I can tell you he would love to have him here so that I not warned him before. But uh, Greg, is a, first of all, he's a great salesperson. He's a sales VP formally. He's a CEO of the company. He's a salesperson. And additionally, he's a visionary. So he can build visionary stories to sell to customers, to investors, to anyone in the company, in the culture, everywhere. And this is something I, I think is, is really cool because I'm a typical German. I'd say, let's say that I, I'm a process guy. <laughs> I'm a data insights guy. I have a kind of vision, but it's very controlled. And Greg had to, uh, taught me really about think much broader, get bigger, get, get think really crazy and get things done and sell that vision. Okay, that's still not my German, this just killed my German roots still. But this is the one I learned from a, a, a big amount of how to define a strategy behind a vision. And that's my vision I want to go to the company for. This is strategy. Now get everybody aligned, ducks in a row, run. Okay. Can I do that? Potentially, yes. Did I try it out? Potentially, no. So can I, can I try that over the next one or two years? Potentially, I will try it. Okay. I'm on the same level. I would never ever say that, but he gives me ideas how to do it better and executing a better a strategy and a vision. So I have a vision for the company. We build a vision for the company here. It's called a V2 mom. Okay, V2 mom is a strategy. It's called vision values, vision values, um, methods, sorry, methods, opportunity, um, obstacles, and uh, measurement. And that's the strategy of the company. You need to get what's the vision of the company, what's the value of the company to the, to the market, uh, what's the obstacles you're running into, uh, so yeah, we obstacle to my, then the methods you want to go into that uh, methods and obstacles, and at the end you how do you want to measure your success over the next three years? And then something it's very tough to build something like that. And I can tell you it was the most thoughtful discussion I ever had with the management team. What are we trying to achieve for years? And it's not just only the startup, the startup investor or the CEO or the the founders in the game. This is the whole management team, guys. Where do we want to be in for years? And it's a big thing. And he was very good in building that, me too, mom. And that's exactly what, I'm, what, I, what I mean with it. So where could this company be in for years? It's a forward thinking, visionary thinking, and strive the whole company against this goal. That's what I learned really from him. And how important it is to make decisions, um, also hard decisions and tough decisions as um, needed. And nobody likes decisions, hard decisions. Nobody likes them. Nobody, oh, I'm here for hard decisions. I'm just working here for hard decisions. No, nobody's doing that. Nobody likes them. But sometimes you have to do it. Especially going higher, the, the management chain, the harder decisions are. They are. They're harder, definitely. Especially know your people. And you have to fire people. And uh, uh, good news is I never had to do that once or twice. But this was a was a different compelling event. But the good news for me, I never had to fire people because it's the most the most the most this the hardest decision you can make as a manager. Who's the one who needs to get fired? That's that's a, that's a hard decision for any manager, any independent of marketing. And that's it's tough, but it's good for the business. And it's good for the business. That's what we care about in the C level. It is what it is. You have to deal with it. But I learned a lot from Greg Bettis about building the vision and make tough decisions. Yeah. Well, and let's talk about the flip side about that. You know, firing obviously is unfortunate, but what is the upside? What are the key qualities of an effective marketer? What are you looking to be as a marketer? What are you looking for when you're hiring? We talked about all different things in your stories about like, you know, the, the different things about data and, but what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? Um, I can tell you one thing, which I, uh, especially in interviews, we can we can talk about that because um, I think my interview approach um, surprises everybody when they're sitting with me in an interview and asking for them, as I said, I have a small team here and I run very slim by utilizing a lot of automation. I just explained that before we get into the interview sections. I do this because I believe in a, in a marketing ratio of one to three, one marketing against three salespeople, which is a very healthy approach, especially in series A, series B. So you know, investors are never question about why do you have so many marketing people? It, it is the case. It's it's the market. It's uh, exactly what happened. I mean, it's not going working well. You run the risk that I uh, replace this marketing person for salesperson. That typical approach of investors. So I'm not giving them a chance. So I don't have so many interviews with marketing, but I have interviews with salespeople and all the others as well because I'm part of that. But my question to marketing, I mean, I hire marketing people is quite easy. 
I'll ask you, why are you measuring yourself on being successful? That's the first, first question. What, what do you think is a successful metric for you? And I can tell you all the answers are, if I create MQLs, if I get PDF downloads, if I get this SQLs, and I said, when I just and I stopped and I said, okay, I don't want to, don't want to interrupt you, but I have to because I don't care. <laughs> okay, and I do that. If a smile on my face, I'm not feeling it. I, I don't tell him. I don't want to get your weaknesses and your strengths. It just don't, don't take this as a classical interview. I'm not doing it. I ask you, what's, what is marketing here for? And if they're coming back with a very good answer, which is a typical good answer, is cost me here to help the company to sell. That's the right answer and nothing else. That's the gameplay. Marketing is here to help to sell. Progress the deal, influence the deal, create the deal, whatever you call it, right? But it's the point. Marketing is here to sell. It's not here for being fancy. The swag department, the t-shirt department, it's not happening. Forget that. It's not because it's a fight. That's the reason I don't want to send a fight between marketing and sales guys. Marketing's not here to just train the MQL. So you have to help sales. That's the gameplay. Sales, marketing is not here to deliver you swag. <laughs> <laughs> opposite way. Okay, sales, ah, fancy department. Just give me something for the event or organize a ticket for my customer or kind of stuff, right? So this is happening sometimes. For me, the important part of a very effective marketer is how, what are you doing to help sales to sell? Well, if you thank you. PDF, go ahead. Sorry, go on. And so for me, this is the this is the measurement of a successful marketer. How do you help sales to sell? That's the only game. Well, I was gonna say thank you for sharing all the stories and lessons from your career about how you've been able to do this. It's was, it was great to listen to. Uh, because I was sales, <laughs> so the opposite side of the house. But I can tell I never got a lead. I never got a lead from me. What's the fancy department at that time? Is that yeah? Nice. Give me a T-shirt. I give you a ticket. I was exactly on the opposite side. I said, whatever you do, it doesn't impact anything on my deal size, a deal, deal pipeline, or helps me to close a deal, or doing anything, or you pay the effort, just not, not a value, because they're all feature-based. I sold differently, and it was not helpful. So uh, also one of the compelling events why I wanted to be, okay, so when you're talking about how you can help sales, maybe you should be on the other side to help sales. So I count myself on, okay, how can I help sales? That, that's the gameplay, and that's uh, what we're doing here as well. So my point is how to help sales, not just how to make marketing fancy, great, big empire, tons of people. I'm not looking at that part. I'm interested in how to help sales. That's, and get, at the end, not sales, the company, to get to the revenue. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your time, Ralph, and thanks for sharing all your stories with us. Thank you for being here with you, Daniel. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com.